I'm speaking in the state of Tamil Nadu, in the deep south of India. This land of India, Bharata, has various states with various cultures and histories. The center of it all is dharma. What keeps this country, or the, what, what's the central defining characteristic of a land with so many different cultures and languages is dharma. A major feature of dharma, the practice of dharma, is the temples, which serve public temples. There are temples in every home, traditionally. But public temples, they serve as cultural, religious, spiritual, social centers of a society based on dharma. And here in Tamil Nadu, is unique in as much as there are literally thousands of amazing, huge temples, many dating back many centuries, over a thousand years. And each one of them has long history with so many amazing happenings. And the, the, the presence of God is felt and he manifests himself not only in the deity form, but in performing amazing activities, entering the hearts of the devotees, empowering the devotees, fulfilling the prayers of the devotees. Tremendous culture based around these huge temples. After centuries of worship in these temples here in Tamil Nadu, there was a demoniac movement, atheistic, wanting to destroy this culture. And it culminated from the 1960s through to the 1980s in the wiping out of practically an entire generation of archakas or worshippers within temples in Tamil Nadu. What happened is that propaganda, demoniac propaganda, bolstered by demoniac government policies, aimed against Brahmins, against faith in God, against religion. It had the effect that people stopped visiting temples. And in this way, the income that came to the temples diminished practically to nothing in some places. And then the Brahmanas who for centuries, generation after generation, had been worshiping in those temples, what could they do? They have families to support and they, most of them started to leave the temples and the traditions of their forefathers just for employment. They weren't employed previously. Employed means they were working in temples and the ancient system was they, they were supported by kings, and rich people, and people would give donations. And in this way, the Brahmins went on with their family life supporting themselves materially with, with the worship of the Lord in the center of their life. But now they found themselves in a situation where they had no support. And they went away and they flourished economically, maybe due to their inherent intelligence, their deeply rooted culture of learning, which used to be based on learning the Vedas and among the Tamil Brahmanas, certain of them, the uh, Divya Prabandhams. Now, unfortunately, their culture of learning and their good intelligence is channeled into secular education, and many of them have become engineers, software engineers. And, uh, They've done well economically, and many of them have gone off to big cities, Bangalore, IT industry, 
overseas. You will find so many in, the, in America powering the big, famous companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, all these things. One other factor, just on the side, is that the quota system, which was supposedly aimed at the reservation system, supposedly aimed at uplifting the what they call the backward classes, it put pressure on the upper, especially the brahmanas, who are practically supposed to be equal rights, but they're practically locked out of opportunities. They had to work harder and really do well to get by at all. So they, their culture of learning, which was centered on the Veda, got channeled into secular learning, and they flourished economically. However, the tradition of generation after generation serving in a particular temple was lost. A young boy growing up in a Brahmin family in a temple town, or maybe in a village, they would be trained from childhood to perform that role, just like the the potter in a village would be trained by his father to perform that role, uh, whatever. This was the, the much maligned caste system. And he, the, the young boys growing up had this pride, not, not the pride of arrogance, but the, the pride of of being part of a great tradition. My father, my grandfather, you see they're such great people. They dedicated their life in the service of God and it's gone back for generation after generation. And the feeling that you have to uphold that, that tradition lost. And the children growing up in Brahmin families, instead of aspiring to serve the Lord, as their life's central focus, they aspire for a job in the USA. Unfortunate. However, some Brahmins stayed on in extreme difficulty, especially in temples in remote areas where anyway there weren't that many people coming. They went on serving with the Services diminished. What can you do if there aren't enough people to do all the services? The temples became dirty and dilapidated and you find bats and snakes inside them and temples that previously resounded daily with chanting of the Vedas and the Divya Prabhandams, silent festivals stopped or just going on in a minimal way. The priests in these, especially in remote areas, they would go on, some of them who stayed despite all difficulty, they would go on with the daily worship. And traditionally, they would have visitors to the temple who would give them a little something. That was their tradition. The visitors to the temple would offer, when you come to the temple, you don't come empty-handed. You offer some fruit or some rice or some ghee or some monetary contribution, some for the deity, some for the priests in, in respect for them and in acknowledgement that they are running on this temple which fulfills my religious need and it's my duty to offer something to them. But what was happening, uh, people weren't coming. Especially at the big festivals, that would be a time when there was some income. I mean, I, I'm not saying that the, the, the Brahmin priests were just fixated on income, but it was something they didn't have to think about because it was so nicely set up that everyone gave a little and they would get by like this. But in many cases, the priests who were struggling on, they didn't have money. They, they had to skip meals. They, the house rent. They, they'd have to beg, borrow. 
they were in a very, very difficult situation. Nowadays, we don't, we have YouTube, we have phones, and people get to know about these things. People didn't know. They just didn't know. The, the, the Brahmins who went off to America, they might not even know how in remote villages uh, their fellow Brahmins were struggling so much. And this went on for years and years. One priest recalled seeing his father struggling with hardly any paisa anyone giving him. Of course, many of the temples were under the government or they're under some trusts and they gave some salary, but just ridiculously low salaries, like some 100 rupees a month or something. Of course, the value of money has gone down a lot, but there was just not enough. And salary wasn't paid to them in many cases. They, even though the salary was so low, still it wasn't paid to them. Or the corrupt government officials would take, in order, in order to get the sign that they'd given the salary, they, they, the corrupt government official would take half the salary and all these things going on. This one priest was recalling how there wasn't even money to light the lamp in the temple. There'd be one vastram, one cloth for the deity for a whole year, should be changed every day. Food offerings to the Lord stopped or absolutely minimal. Regular festivals, which used to be observed with great pomp, stopped. Despite all these difficulties, some of the priests went on. They'd go daily to the temple without fail. Even other priests weren't there. No crowd was coming. They would go on thinking that this is my service to the Lord. This is what my forefathers have done. This is what they want me to do. Not complaining, just going on, going on, going on. But it looked like the demoniac policies were working. Their demoniac policies to destroy the bhakti culture looked like they were working and the traditions and the whole sampradayas would be lost because these demoniac people who are against Vedic culture, who are against God, well, of course, they're not against Islamic God or Christian ideas of God, but they particularly focused on what is called Hinduism. But they know, just like previous asuras, like, Hiranyakashipu and Kangsa, they knew that if they could destroy the Brahmin class, then the whole culture would be lost so that they, the demons could flourish. So in the same way, without literally killing the Brahminas, they wanted to kill their whole culture and their whole way of life. They knew that if the priests who take care of the daily rituals at these temples, if they would somehow or other driven away from these temples, diverted from their course, the whole culture will be lost. It was a major part of their demoniac strategy. However, there is now a revival going on and despite so much demoniac propaganda for decades, which has had a terrible toll on the culture, more and more people here in Tamil Nadu, and it's true th throughout the country, more and more people are visiting temples. Over the last few years, it's, it's really picking up. It's probably something to do directly or indirectly with the activities of ISKCON, uh, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. It's a, 
strange situation in Kali Yoga that people like myself coming from a very fallen, non-devotional, uncultured, untouchable kind of background have somehow or other by the plan of the Lord, by the mercy of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu been engaged in propagating this devotional culture and it's having its effect throughout the land of Bharata. And certain individuals have had a great effect. Well known is Velaguri Krishnan who has made a huge positive impact. He was working as a chartered accountant. His father was a Vedic scholar who used to give Upanyasams, lectures, and Velaguri Krishnan also wanted to do that. So in 1996, in his mid-30s, he left his job as a chartered accountant to devote himself fully to lecturing on devotional topics. His lectures have become very well known, very influential. He's worked hard to maintain and revive the traditions. And now his son is continuing in his footsteps. I'd mentioned about remote temples struggle so much, but even at big temples, um, among which the Ranganath Swami temple in Sri Rangam is the biggest, most famous, most central to the whole Sri Vaishnava tradition. There also, so many young brahmanas, they left, mostly they all left. In 2015, one of them, Harish Bhatta, he became the first of the hereditary priests at the Ranganath Swami temple to, who'd gone away. He became the first of those who had gone away to take up a corporate job. He was the first to just quit all that and return to the temple and take up his hereditary services. He had a high paying banking job at age 27. He quit it all within his own community even. He was criticized and doubted. What are you doing? You got a good job. You see the, the aspirations of the whole community had changed. But now things are changing, people are coming and the economic prospects are improved for priests at the temples and that's prompting other hereditary priests who are not doing that job to come back, come back to their roots at the Ranganath Swami temple and other temples. It will be glorious if many more of the hereditary servitors of the Lord in Vaishnav temples, Shaiva temples, Shakta temples, if they were to return to their temple duties and then the glorious golden days can revive and every temple with many priests to perform multifarious services and all the time in the temples, the Veda mantras being chanted and talks being given, Upanyasams, festivals celebrated in a grand way, gurukuls, revived real gurukuls, which teach only the traditional subjects without what happens, what happens nowadays, even the few gurukuls that are going on, they teach secular subjects also because it's thought, how are you going to support your family if you just dedicate yourself to God? That's what people think. We can't blame those who left the temples in those dark days, but we must praise those who stayed. Tremendous devotion to go through all difficulties. I have to serve the Lord. And by the grace of the Lord, yoga kshemam vahami aham, 
uh, the Lord protected and maintained them. And definitely their devotional assets, <laughs> maybe they didn't have material assets much, but their devotional assets were appreciated by the Lord who they're serving, which is all that really matters at the end of life. It doesn't matter how comfortably you've lived in this world. All that matters is how much we've praised the Supreme Lord, who is the real object of life for everyone. Some lessons for our ISKCON devotees. Let's recognize pujaris who day after day, year after year, go on serving, and many also in difficult situations, in many temples, in South America and Europe, the, the temples have gone through very, very difficult times and are still going through. But some pujaris have remained and gone on serving despite all difficulties. Whether or not we recognize them, Krishna will recognize them, is recognizing them, no doubt. Srila Prabhupada said that pujari should not be paid, but some arrangements should be made for them, especially if they're married, which many, if not most of them are. You can't expect them to act on the platform of renunciance. It makes sense that some arrangement is made for them to be free of financial worries. They, they have their day-to-day -day expenses and also they need to consider their future requirement, just like their children's marriage, and so many things like that. Discussing these topics can also give hope to those temples of ISKCON which are struggling. I mentioned South America, Latin America in general. We have many temples which are struggling on economically, not so many devotees they're serving full-time in Europe also. There are many temples like that. So can also give hope that circumstances can change. The tide will turn. And again, the temples will be full of vibrant, blissful devotees, a lot of chanting, a lot of life, a lot of activities. Krishna is the supreme controller. Kali Yoga is very bad. Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevalam. We should maximize this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra all over the world. But we also have temples and where deities are installed, it's not a small thing. We should be very diligent to worship the deities in the most proper way and not neglect that. We should also be careful about installing deities in situations where we can't be very confident that their service will be carried on in the first class manner. If we're gonna worship deities, it has to be first class. First class manner, well into the future. Hare Krishna.